In the middle of the previous century, flying saucers were constantly making headlines. America was going through a surge of reported UFO sightings. So, it shouldn't probably come as a surprise that the American authorities, namely the U.S. Air Force, created a couple of short-lived programs. Those were Project Sign and Project Grudge, and their main goal was to look into that phenomenon. These programs were followed by likely the most famous of them all, Project Blue Book. It was a large-scale government study that lasted from 1951 to 1969. The initiator of this program was Major General Charles P. Cabell. He was a former intelligence director of the Air Force. Project Blue Book scrupulously gathered over 12,600 reports about people seeing bizarre unidentified objects in the sky. After thorough research, it was determined that most of those had natural, quite mundane explanations. As for the rest of the reports, the members of Project Blue Book simply didn't have enough data to evaluate them. That's why support for their efforts dwindled. Officially, Project Blue Book was closed in December 1969. But apparently, it didn't make American authorities lose interest in UFO sightings. Because in mid-December 2017, the world found out that they had secretly launched one more UFO research program in the late 2000s. Accordingly to certain documents, American authorities spent around $22 million over a four-year span on a project called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, aka AADIP. This project was started in 2007, and its main goal was to study UFO phenomena. Most likely, all this activity was triggered by the 2004 Tic Tac incident. That's when a few U.S. Air Force pilots spotted unidentified flying objects off the coast of California. They captured them on video. None of the pilots could figure out what these objects were. They behaved in a weird way, as if our laws of physics didn't apply to them. They were reportedly flying extremely fast and rotating in unpredictable movements. It looks as if after that incident, American authorities decided to investigate whether those objects could be identified or not. And if not, they were eager to know where they had come from and if they had been a threat. When the New York Times story about the new project broke, officials announced that the study had been terminated in 2012. Uh, however, there were people who claimed that the program was still ongoing. One of those was a military intelligence official running the program until they quit in October 2016. In any case, let's have a closer look at this mysterious program. Indeed, the areas of research funded by the project resembled things you could find in Star Trek. For example, one grant was for the study of traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. This study was conducted by Eric W. Davis of EarthTech International Inc. Another grant sponsored the research of invisibility cloaking. One more area of study included warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. This research was conducted by a theoretical physicist and director of the nonprofit Icarus Interstellar. As we've already mentioned, all these studies received at least $22 million of funding, but this sum could have been much bigger. No one has revealed why or how these studies were given such huge grants under the AATI program. The results of the study aren't known publicly either. The criteria for choosing these fields of research could be that warp drives and stargates might be useful for extraterrestrial civilizations traveling interstellar distances to visit our planet. Still, some people are not amused that such questionable fields of study were receiving substantial government funding. What if our moon was hollow? Would we be able to hide inside in case some terrible catastrophe destroyed our home planet? Well, the supporters of the hollow moon theory believe that it's actually a real option. The hollow moon is a hypothesis claiming that Earth's moon is either completely hollow or has quite a lot of place inside. The thing is, the moon is less dense than Earth, and it seems to support the idea of its hollowness. But according to science, the reason is the fact that Earth's upper mantle and crust are less dense than the heavy iron core of our planet. Then, 
there's also the claim that the moon rings like a bell. For almost a decade, between 1969 and 1977, seismometers installed on the moon by the Apollo missions kept recording moonquakes. The moon was reported to be ringing like a bell during such quakes, especially shallow ones. On the 20th of November, 1969, Apollo 12 deliberately crashed the ascent stage of its lunar module into the surface of our natural satellite. According to NASA, after that, the ringing continued for almost an hour. This made some people argue that the moon must be hollow like a bell. Later, lunar seismology researched those shallow moonquakes and showed that they acted differently than quakes on our planet, mostly due to differences in type, texture, and density of the lunar and Earth's rock layers. The speed of sound waves in solids is determined by the medium's compressibility and density. No one has ever found any evidence of a large, empty space inside the moon. And still, in 1970, Michael Vassin and Alexander Sherbakov suggested a hypothesis that the moon could be a spaceship designed by mysterious extraterrestrial beings. In 1965, writer Isaac Asimov made an observation that added fuel to the fire of conspiracy theories. He marveled at the sheer astronomical accident that the moon fits so snugly over the sun during total eclipses. The sun's greater distance makes up for the incomparably larger size of the star. As a result, it seems to us that the moon and the sun are the same size. The author added that there was no astronomical reason why the sun and the moon should fit so well. So since the 1970s, conspiracy theorists have been quoting Asimov's words about solar eclipses as evidence of the artificial origin of the moon. Mainstream astronomers disagree with such an interpretation, saying that the angular diameters of the moon and the sun don't perfectly match during eclipses. They vary by several percent over time. Many other pieces of evidence confirm that the moon is a solid body that formed after a planetoid crashed into Earth. In the past, Scientists thought that the moon appeared after our rapidly spinning planet got rid of a good chunk of its mass. This idea was suggested in 1879 by George Darwin, the son of the very Charles Darwin, the famous biologist. This theory remained popular until the Apollo missions. Then, in 1925, Austrian geologist Otto Ampferer offered another idea, that Earth and the moon could have formed together from a primordial accretion disk a rotating disk of dense gas and dust surrounding a young, newly formed star and used to be a double system. The third theory stated that the moon could have once been a planetoid caught by the gravity of our planet. The modern explanation usually involves the giant impact hypothesis. According to it, a Mars-sized space body hit Earth and created a debris ring around our planet. In the end, this ring gathered into a single natural satellite, our moon. But getting back to the hollow moon theory, at the moment, there's no scientific evidence to support this hypothesis. Seismic observations and other data indicate that the moon has a solid interior with several layers, a thin crust, quite extensive mantle, and a dense core. These days, the idea of the hollow moon is considered to be a conspiracy theory. Technological progress does not stand still, and over the past decade, the resolution of images of the lunar surface has improved greatly. Many pits have been discovered on the surface, and some of them are really impressive in size. The largest are hundreds of feet deep. However, technology is not yet advanced enough for us to study the bottom of such pits in detail. That's why a recent discovery is surprising. It turns out that huge pits can extend deep into the rock of the moon. It's a groundbreaking discovery. Let's figure out why. So look at this giant underground cave. Leonardo Carrere and Lorenzo Bruzzone from the University of Trento were thrilled to finally confirm the existence of such structures on the moon. They analyzed images taken by the Mini RF instrument on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2010. The original images didn't have excellent resolution, so the authors had to do a huge amount of work using modern data analysis and modeling techniques. But first things first, why does it all matter so much? Well, instead of building homes on the surface of the moon, we might be able to live inside these natural caves. They could offer protection from dangerous things like harmful space radiation, extreme temperature swings, and even meteorites. 
according to planetary geologist Wes Patterson from Johns Hopkins. Even though we'd still have to bring materials from Earth to make those caves habitable, using them would be a lot easier and cheaper than building bases on the surface. Based on the collected data, the cave is about 150 feet wide and up to 260 feet long, which is just a bit smaller than a football field. It's located in a deep pit called the Mare Tranquillitatis Pit, which likely formed when an ancient lava tube collapsed. Although the moon has no active volcanoes today, billions of years ago, its surface was covered with lava that flowed through valleys, carving out these tubes below the surface. Over time, some of the lava tubes became unstable and collapsed, creating pits like the one in question. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, has already found more than 200 of such pits on the moon. It means there could be hundreds of hidden caves waiting to be explored on our satellite. When publishing their findings in Nature Astronomy, the researchers suggested that the caves could offer future astronauts a safe place to live and work, protecting them from the moon's extreme conditions. And extreme they are. One of the biggest challenges of living on the moon is its temperatures. The lunar surface gets extremely hot during the day, reaching about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the temperature drops below minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit at night. But inside the caves, the temperature could stay much more consistent. A separate study done in 2022 used computer simulations to predict that some of those caves could maintain a comfortable temperature of about 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Much easier to manage, right? Unfortunately, getting to the caves won't be easy. The Mare Tranquillitatis Cave is over 400 feet below the surface, at the bottom of a steep slope covered in loose debris. It would take some clever engineering to get up and down that slope. The options could be using jetpacks, a lunar elevator, or some other kind of technology. We must find a way to transport astronauts safely. There's also a lot more to discover. Radar technology could help scientists find even more caves and lava tubes on the moon. In the future, a spacecraft with higher resolution radar could even map the insides of the pits that LRO has already found. According to the researchers, this kind of complete survey could help them figure out the best locations for future lunar bases and other explorations. And there's another potential bonus. Those caves could contain water. Scientists have already found frozen water on the moon, under the surface, and in permanently shadowed craters. Tiny amounts are also scattered across the lunar dirt. Water is a critical resource for any moon base, and finding it in the caves could make the idea of living there even more realistic. All in all, this discovery could be a game changer for lunar exploration. Living in natural caves on the moon might be a more practical and safer option than building something on the surface. It could also bring us one step closer to making the moon a place where humans can live and work for the long term. A Dyson Sphere is a theoretical mega-project, a ginormous sphere encircling a star with platforms orbiting in tight formation. It's supposed to be an ultimate solution both for energy production and living space. The creators of a Dyson Sphere get a lot of surface area for habitation and the ability to catch every tiny bit of solar radiation and heat produced by their central star. The first person to theorize about such a bizarre construction was British-American theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson. According to him, an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization could consider building this sphere after colonizing some moons and planets in their local stellar neighborhood. With the growth of their population, these aliens would need more and more energy to sustain their lives. Dyson calculated that assuming that this alien society grew at 1% per year, their area and energy needs would become a trillion times larger in a mere 3,000 years. And if their solar system contained a space body similar in size to Jupiter, they could take it apart and spread its mass in a spherical shell by building a structure at twice the distance between our planet and the Sun this amount of material would be sufficient to build a huge number of orbiting platforms. Each of them could be six to ten feet thick, which would basically allow this civilization to live on their star-facing surfaces. A shell this thick could be comfortably habitable and capable of holding all the equipment needed for using solar radiation without falling onto the star from the inside. 
But after absorbing all this solar energy, the sphere would have to re-radiate it. Otherwise, the energy would build up, eventually causing the construction to melt. It means that the light of a star wrapped in a Dyson sphere would look dimmed or even completely darkened, depending on how dense the platforms orbiting it were. At the same time, it would glow unusually bright in infrared wavelengths invisible to the unaided eye. Because of this infrared radiation, Dyson spheres are classified as a type of techno-signature. It's a sign of activity that astronomers can use to discover intelligent life forms in the universe. Some Earth-based researchers have infrared maps of the night sky they examine in hopes of spotting Dyson spheres. So far, no one has ever found one. However, one study has selected several Dyson sphere candidates. Its authors have processed large amounts of information using a special data pipeline for combining and analyzing information. One of the main search criteria is the detection of excessive infrared radiation. At the same time, it's important to distinguish this radiation from that emitted by natural objects. After a complicated filtering of millions of objects, the researchers identified seven potential Dyson spheres. Sure, further analysis is needed to determine their nature. To do this, scientists want to use optical spectroscopy, which may reveal more details about these objects and their origins. At the same time, the researchers admit that these candidate Dyson spheres might have other explanations. For example, they could be debris disks or protoplanetary disks of young stars. Only more research can show whether we can find traces of other civilizations among star systems. For now, it's still an open question. Interestingly, Dyson spheres have been spoken about a lot in science fiction. As far back as 1937, a novel called Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon described systems in one particular galaxy that were surrounded by a gauze of light traps which focused solar energy for intelligent use. That was the reason why the entire galaxy was dimmed. In another novel, Ring World, the writer spoke about a ring-shaped artificial structure surrounding a star. One of the greatest mysteries in human history is probably the origins of the Great Pyramid of Giza. This massive, awe-inspiring structure has been puzzling pretty much everyone for thousands of years. How did ancient engineers, without modern tools or machines, manage to pull off something so jaw-droppingly monumental? Could it be that they had a bit of extraterrestrial help? We'll dwell on this theory a bit later, but first, how about one of the more tradiatonal explanations? It claims that ancient workers could have built massive ramps to haul giant stones up to the pyramid's higher levels. It sounds reasonable until you find out that there's barely any archaeological evidence for these ramps. Sure, smaller ramps might have been used, but huge, miles-long ramps? Not likely. And even if they had existed, they would have been an enormous feat in themselves, since the builders would have needed almost as much material for the ramp as for the pyramid itself. This is where things get interesting. Since the ramp theory doesn't fully hold up, we're left with an even bigger mystery. How did the Egyptians move millions of multi-ton stones with such precision? Well, some people point to extraterrestrial visitors. The idea that aliens might have been behind the construction of the pyramids has existed for decades. According to this theory, the pyramids were just too advanced for humans to have built on their own. The precision of the architecture, the sheer scale of the project, and the mysterious mathematical principles at play have made many people believe that some outside force must have lent a hand. One of the biggest arguments the supporters of this theory have is that building something as perfect as the Great Pyramid would have required a bird's eye view. And who could have had that view? Certainly not humans, but maybe a spaceship. Aliens could have hovered above, guiding the construction. If you thought things couldn't get any more mysterious, let's talk about the golden ratio. A mathematical principle you can meet everywhere in nature, from seashells to galaxies. And the Great Pyramid's proportions seem to align almost perfectly with the golden ratio. Alien theorists point to this as evidence that the Egyptians couldn't have pulled this off without some extraterrestrial help. Some people even went so far as to claim that alien remains had been found inside the Great Pyramid. But before you get too excited, keep in mind that there's no solid evidence to back this up. And still, let's take a closer look inside the Great Pyramid. 
If the exterior is impressive, the interior is downright mind-blowing. It's a labyrinth of tunnels, shafts, and chambers so complex that it's no wonder people have speculated about alien involvement. How could ancient humans have designed something so intricate and mysterious? Some believers say this is further proof that the pyramids were more than just tombs. They were either built or influenced by some kind of divine or extraterrestrial intelligence. And now, let's get into one of the wildest ideas. What if the pyramids were built to align with the stars or even act as part of an ancient space elevator? Some theorists suggest that the pyramids were aligned with certain constellations and served as landing sites for alien spacecraft. Come to think about it, the site indeed sounds like a cosmic airport. All those sharp angles, the perfect geometry, the precise alignment with the stars. Others go even further, proposing that the pyramids were part of a long-lost spacefaring technology. They could have been used to harness energy from stars or served as gateways between worlds. So, are the pyramids really ancient alien landing sites? Were they part of a cosmic energy grid? So far, there's no scientific proof to support these ideas. The Great Pyramid, with all its secrets and unanswered questions, continues to captivate everyone's attention. It's a reminder that there are still things in this world, and maybe beyond it, that we just don't fully understand. Most people know that pyramids were built as grand tombs for the pharaohs, designed to ensure they had a smooth journey to the afterlife. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for instance, was constructed for the pharaoh Khufu. But what most people don't know is that this whole pyramid building trend started right here with the Step Pyramid of Djoser about 4,700 years ago. This massive structure was built for Pharaoh Djoser, a ruler from Egypt's third dynasty. It rises seven layers high above the ground and stands about 200 feet tall. We think of it today as a phenomenal architectural project. But for ancient Egyptians, the Step Pyramid of Djoser turned out to be more like a massive experiment, a trial run, if you will, to perfect their building skills before they moved on to even more ambitious pyramids. Reaching new heights is super exciting, but the real mystery is what is going on below the ground. In this pyramid's underground labyrinth, there is a network of tunnels stretching about three and a half miles long. And some researchers believe these tunnels might have been part of a sophisticated water system that could completely change what we think about pyramid construction. Let's talk about this massive complex located in Saqqara. Surrounding the pyramid, there's what's known as a dry moat, a continuous trench that is up to 164 feet wide and almost 2 miles long. It forms a sort of rectangular shape around the pyramid. This trench has an average depth of about 65 feet. Now, if you were to add up all the earth and rock they dug out to create this moat, it would be about 10 times the volume of the step pyramid itself. For the longest time, people just assumed this trench was nothing more than a huge quarry, a place where they dug up stone and clay to build the step pyramid. Makes sense, right? Hmm. But when you take a closer look, it doesn't add up. The trench is too narrow and deep to be practical for mining, and its layout doesn't match anything we know about ancient Egyptian quarrying methods. Plus, some sections of the trench are actually covered with a rocky ceiling, which would have made it nearly impossible to use as a quarry. Another theory suggests that the dry moat had some kind of spiritual significance. Maybe it was a sacred place, where souls of nobles gathered to serve the late king in the afterlife. There are even niches in the walls that work as a hint at this spiritual function. But most researchers believe that this purpose likely developed much later, long after the complex was built for Djoser. So what was the moat really designed for? In 2020, a researcher came up with a pretty intriguing idea. It is possible that this trench was actually designed to collect and manage water, especially after heavy rainfalls. Now, that makes sense when you consider the location. The moat sits in an area that could easily have been flooded by runoff water from nearby plains. This could also explain why the trench wasn't used for new graves until much later when the climate became drier and less prone to flooding. The story becomes even more intriguing 
as this trench appears to be part of a larger, more complex hydraulic system within the Djoser complex. It is like the trench has several compartments, carefully carved out of the rock and connected by tunnels. These compartments likely served as a part of a water treatment system, where water would flow from one compartment to the next, getting cleaner as it moved along. Now, here is where things start to tie into the pyramid itself. The Djoser complex has a series of underground shafts, and some researchers think that water from the moat's deep trench might have been used to power a hydraulic lift system. And this giant water-powered elevator could have been used to raise the heavy stones needed to build the pyramid. It worked like a volcano, but instead of lava, water did the heavy lifting. Imagine a big, deep hole in the ground at the center of the pyramid site. Inside this hole, there was a huge wooden platform, kind of like a giant raft that could move up and down. When the workers wanted to lift a heavy stone, they would fill the hole with water. As the water rose, the wooden platform started to float up, carrying the stone with it, almost like a giant water-powered elevator. When the stone reached the right height, the workers slid it off the platform and onto the pyramid. The idea is that water from the deep trench, after being cleaned and filtered, would flow into these shafts. A massive float, possibly made of wood, would then rise as the water filled the shaft lifting the stones up to where they were needed for construction. Once the stone was in place, they'd let the water out, lowering the platform back down to the bottom, ready to lift the next stone. This fancy hydraulic lift system could have been a game-changer, making the whole building process a lot faster and more efficient without using a lot of workforce. It is like the ancient Egyptians were already embracing the whole idea of work smarter, not harder. But, of course, not everyone is on board with this theory. Some experts argue that the area where the Step Pyramid of Djoser was built couldn't have held enough water from occasional rains to maintain such a fancy hydraulic system. The main theory suggests that, in the past, there might have been some kind of lake nearby that would have filled up after a period of rain, and this lake could have supplied water to the complex's hydraulic system. But there is no mention of such a lake in any ancient Egyptian writings. So it might be more of a what-if situation than a reality. And then there's the issue of the hard work itself. Remember when I said this method could have allowed the ancient builders to raise stones with far less effort? Well, that might not be entirely true. According to some experts, just building this hydraulic device would have required a lot more heavy work than simply moving the stone blocks using good old-fashioned manpower. And let's not forget, the step pyramid of Djoser is like a baby pyramid compared to those that came later. The stones used for Djoser's pyramid weighed, on average, about 660 pounds each, which is nothing compared to the more than 2.5 ton blocks used later for the pyramid of Chephren. If this cool water lift theory gets completely ruled out, we still need to explain how this pyramid was built in the first place. To answer that, we need to rewind a bit and talk about the original plans. See, before Djoser's tomb became a pyramid, the idea was to construct a simple mastaba. This type of tomb was pretty common in earlier periods – a flat-roofed, rectangular structure with sloping sides. But after the original mastaba was finished, they decided to expand it a bit by adding more layers on top. And then they added even more layers, until the construction reached six distinctive steps, each one smaller than the previous. And they probably did all this by raising those heavy stones using ramps, not a water-powered elevator. There is still so much we don't know about the Step Pyramid of Djoser. More research is definitely needed to fully understand how this system worked, or if it even existed at all. But the idea of using water to help build the pyramid adds a whole new layer to our understanding of ancient Egyptian engineering. It's a powerful reminder of just how clever and resourceful those builders were, using the natural landscape and the power of water to create one of the most iconic monuments in history. We know that the ancient Egyptians were talented enough to build something as grand as the pyramids, but were they also smart enough to measure the speed of light? 
There's a theory circulating online that says exactly that. If you look at these two numbers, you'll see that they match completely. The first one is the speed of light in a vacuum measured in meters, and the second one is the latitude of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So was it done on purpose, or is it just a coincidence? Well, happily, we can tell you that it's actually just a coincidence, not another conspiracy thingy. The Great Pyramid is just one of the many places in the world that share the same latitude. And more importantly, even if the ancient Egyptians had somehow measured the speed of light and chosen to keep it a secret from the rest of the world, they wouldn't have used meters to put it down. Meters were only defined at the end of the 18th century. The builders of the pyramids used a different unit of measure called cubits. One cubit is equal to one and a half feet. Cubit was based on the length of the arm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, and it became popular in the ancient world. So if they wanted to impress the rest of the world and set the pyramids at a point that matched the speed of light in cubits, they would have to build their iconic constructions somewhere in Europe. And then the Danish astronomer who first measured the speed of light in 1676 would have been really upset to know that someone had done it centuries before him. So although they were ahead of their time in many aspects, the ancient Egyptians never measured the speed of light or used longitude and latitude to map their locations. The base of the Great Pyramid of Giza might seem like a perfect square, but it's actually an eight-sided structure, not four-sided. Each of its four sides has a subtle concave indentation that splits it evenly from base to tip. The official version is that a British pilot was the first to notice it in 1940 while flying over the pyramid. He took a photograph that showed shadows highlighting these indentations. Some people think these lines are only visible from above and can best be seen at dawn and dusk during the spring and autumn equinoxes. This has led to a freaky theory that the ancient Egyptians might have designed the pyramids to communicate with something looking at them from above. Uh huh. Now, the Great Pyramid is one of only three pyramids that used to have a swivel door. It weighed around 20 tons, but they could still easily open it from the inside. Its precise fit made it nearly invisible from the outside, with no visible latch or handle. There were only slight variations in the exterior stone that gave out an opening. The other two pyramids with similar doors belong to Khufu's father and grandfather. The Great Pyramid also has a hidden void at least 100 feet long that was only found in 2017. We still don't know what lies within the space, what purpose it served, or if it is the only space of its kind. Researchers use the same tech to see through cathedral walls, Mayan pyramids, and even volcanoes. It depends on a natural shower of subatomic particles called muons. They pass more easily through empty space than through solid materials. So if they arrange multiple muon detectors around a structure, scientists can map out its solid and empty areas. A team of scientists placed muon detectors inside the Great Pyramid and allowed them to gather data for months. Scientists have analyzed samples of the mortar used to build the pyramid many times. Although we know its composition, modern technology still can't replicate it. The mortar is mostly made from processed gypsum, but it wasn't used like the cement we use for bricks today. Instead, they used it to support the joints between the massive stones as they were set in place. The estimated amount they needed to construct the Great Pyramid was around half a million tons of mortar. The gypsum mortar is stronger than the stones themselves and is held up for thousands of years. Now, all four sides of the Great Pyramid are aligned with the cardinal points – north, south, east, and west. According to geologist and engineer Glenn Dash, the alignment is accurate to within 4 minutes of arc, or 1 15th of a degree. The architects managed to achieve this without modern tools like drones, blueprints, or computers. Many researchers tried to explain this construction miracle. Maybe they used the pole star or the sun's shadow. Dash recently proposed a new simpler idea. The Egyptians might have used the autumnal equinox to align the pyramids. It happens twice a year when the Earth's equator passes through the center of the Sun's disk, making day and night nearly equal in length. To test his theory, Dash conducted an experiment on the 22nd of September 2016, the first day of the fall equinox. He used a special rod the Egyptians had to cast a shadow and track its tip at regular intervals, forming a smooth curve. By connecting two points of the curve with a taut string, 
he created an almost perfect east-west line. Dash noted that on the equinox, the shadow's tip runs in a straight line, nearly perfectly east-west, and with a slight counterclockwise error. There's a similar error in the pyramids. Although his experiment was conducted in Connecticut, Dash believes that the same method would work in Egypt. All the ancient Egyptians needed was a clear, sunny day. They could determine the fall equinox by counting 91 days from the summer solstice. But they left us few clues, and no engineering documents or architectural plans have been found that explain their methods. So they might have mapped shadows, but it's not definite. Now, scientists have long wondered how heavy stone blocks were carried to the pyramid sites, and they might finally have an answer. A research team from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, has discovered that 31 pyramids are likely to have been built along a long-lost ancient branch of the River Nile. It's now hidden under desert and farmland. For many years, archaeologists have thought that ancient Egyptians must have used a nearby waterway to transport materials, equipment, people, and whatever else they needed to build the pyramids on the river. But up until now, they weren't certain of the location, shape, size, or proximity of this waterway to the site of the pyramids. The group of researchers used radar satellite imagery, historical maps, geophysical surveys, and sediment coring to map the river branch. They believe it was buried by a major drought and sandstorms thousands of years ago. The team managed to go below the sand surface and get images of some hidden features thanks to radar technology. They found hidden rivers and ancient structures running at the foothills of where most of the ancient Egyptian pyramids lie. The discovery of this extinct river branch helps explain the high pyramid density between Giza and Lish, in what is now an inhospitable area of the Sahara Desert. Now, Egypt isn't the only country with the most pyramids in the world. The champion's title here goes to its southern neighbor, Sudan. It has between 200 and 255 pyramids, compared to Egypt's measly 138. They were built by members of the Kingdom of Kush, an ancient civilization that ruled the lands along the Nile River many years ago. They started erecting pyramids around 500 years after the Egyptians had stopped doing it. Their pyramids are much smaller than the Egyptian ones, but were built for the same purposes. Archaeologists are still working to find out how the pyramids in the Sudan were built, how long it took to complete them, and what happened to their society. If there's a question that still baffles archaeologists to this day, it's this one. How did the ancient Egyptians build those magnificent pyramids? As far as we know today, their resources were quite limited, especially in terms of tools and building materials. We still don't have a fully satisfying answer. But hey, we've got some pretty amazing theories worth considering. The leading contender among these theories involves the clever Egyptians employing a sneaky strategy. Now picture this. They constructed a slanted and curving mound made of bricks, earth, and sand encircling the pyramid to be. As the pyramid grew taller and taller, they simply increased the height and length of this wacky structure. It's like they were playing an ancient game of Jenga. Now. How did they get those massive stone blocks up there? Well, according to the legendary ancient Greek historian Herodotus, they used sleds, rollers, and levers. It sounds like they turned construction into a supersized game of tug-of-war. And guess what? Herodotus also claimed that the Great Pyramid, you know, the one from Giza, the granddaddy of them all, took a whopping 20 years to build. There's more. Herodotus also dropped a mind-boggling number on us. 100,000 men were supposedly involved in this pyramid extravaganza. Did they hire the entire Egyptian population? Well, it might not be as far-fetched as it sounds. These men were probably mostly farmers, so they probably focused on the pyramids when there wasn't much work to be done in the fields. You know, like during the flood season of the Nile River. Obviously, specialists in the archaeological community had something to add to this theory. By the late 20th century, they discovered some evidence that suggests the workforce might have been smaller and more permanent than previously thought. Instead of a massive army of 100,000 pyramid builders, they proposed that a modest crew of around 20,000 workers, accompanied by support personnel like bakers, physicians, and even spiritual leaders, could have gotten the job done. There was also this theory that claimed that the pyramids were actually built from the top downward. 
it suggested that these colossal structures were nothing more than isolated hills used as quarries. The stones were supposedly drawn from these hills, and over time, competing engineers took charge and transformed them into the iconic pyramids we know today. Now, before you dismiss this theory as a wild fantasy, some folks thought it wasn't completely crazy. After all, there are instances where isolated hills exist, so maybe this theory had a tiny glimmer of truth. Whether it involved ramp building or ingenious work schedules, one thing is clear. Those pyramids have definitely left their mark on history and on our imaginations. Now, Speaking of ancient Egyptian mysteries, there's this gigantic unfinished obelisk sitting in ancient Egypt, and scientists are trying to figure out how it was shaped. Now, Some people suggest that our industrious ancestors use handheld pounders to get the job done. One expert has a different take on the matter, though. He argues that if we take a closer look at the pattern left behind by the shaping tool, we'll notice something peculiar. The walls of the trenches surrounding the obelisk display a neat and even pattern, which is pretty unlikely if they were pounded away by mere mortal hands. According to this expert, those horizontal striations are usually the result of a tool that takes breaks while removing material, leaving its mark on the surface. But wait, there's more! Imagine the tool being rocked back and forth against the trench walls, clearing away the waste to keep the trench from narrowing. Well, in that case, the tool might have left some funky horizontal striations where it was pressed against the sidewall. This sounds like some fancy technology at play, don't you think? And guess what? The dynastic Egyptians probably didn't have access to that kind of know-how. Another famous Egyptologist from way back also uncovered a bunch of core drills during his adventures. Although the actual drill bits are missing, his collection houses these particular core remnants made of limestone, alabaster, and even granite. These constructions aren't the only amazing thing the ancient Egyptians left behind, though. As it turns out, the Egyptians were the genius minds behind the creation of the handheld mirror. Yeah, that little mirror you use every day to check yourself out. But here's the twist. These mirrors are like pieces of art. They were decorated with inscriptions and figures. But that's not all. The Egyptians had a serious concern with their appearance. They knew the importance of personal hygiene and looking fabulous. So, in their quest for pearly whites, they invented toothbrushes and toothpaste. Dental problems were pretty common back then, and their smiles weren't exactly all white. Dentistry wasn't their strongest suit, you see. Maybe their minds were distracted by all that pyramid building. So that doesn't mean those ancient toothpaste recipes weren't amazing. One delightful concoction included rock salt, mint, dried iris petals, and pepper. Some brave dentists in the 21st century tried it out, and it worked pretty well. Ground-up ash was also used in another recipe to create a tooth-cleansing paste. Mint was missing, so that didn't do much for their breath. That's when the genius Egyptians came up with the world's first breath mints. They made tablets from heated spices like cinnamon, and they mixed it with honey. Now, let's shift gears to home decor, Egyptian style. They surely took ornamentation to the next level. While the concept of decorating furniture started in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians cranked it up a notch. They went all out with different colors of ink and even developed various weights of paper. Oh, and let's not forget about those cute little area rugs we all have in our homes today. Guess who came up with the idea? Yep, the Egyptians. They used the versatile papyrus plant to make those cozy rugs. And speaking of trends, the Egyptians loved their knickknacks. They had an assortment of small figurines in the shapes of cats, dogs, and people. These statues were made from various materials, like simple sun-dried mud to the ultimate bling of gold. It all depended on how loaded you were. The Egyptians were also all about farming, and they knew that clean water was crucial for their crops and animals. That's why they came up with some nifty inventions and techniques to make sure their land was fertile and their plants were happy. First off, they had the genius idea of using ox-drawn plows. They had two types of plows, heavy and light. The heavy plow would strut its stuff, cutting deep furrows in the soil while the lighter plow followed behind, fluffing up the earth. But they didn't stop there. After plowing, the Egyptians would break up clumps of soil and sow the rows with seeds. 
to give those seeds a good old squish into the furrows, they'd march their livestock across the field, effectively closing up the furrows. But hey, all that hard work would be pointless if their seeds were as dry as the Sahara. That's where irrigation comes into play. The Egyptians were so good at it that other cultures, like the Greeks and Romans, couldn't help but copy their techniques. Now let's switch gears and talk about the marvelous architecture of ancient Egypt. These folks weren't just skilled farmers, they were also architectural maestros. They built these fancy canals to carry water to farms and villages, and boy, did they know how to make those canals look pretty. Just imagine strolling along a canal lined with ornate structures. The pharaoh Ramesses the Great was quite the overachiever when it came to construction. One of his mind-blowing creations was the construction located at Abu Simbel. This building was designed so that twice a year, the sun would shine directly into it and illuminate the statues of Ramesses. And let's not forget about the corbelled arch. Without this architectural gem, we'd be missing out on some mind-boggling structures like the Great Pyramid. The Egyptians knew how to make things stand tall and proud, thanks to their engineering and construction wizardry. They built grand halls and inner sanctums that make your jaw drop. And some of these temples doubled as astronomical observatories. Venus is often called Earth's evil twin. The thing is, this world once started off quite similar to our home planet. But later, something went wrong. These days, the two planets are relatively close and similar in size. But Venus's atmosphere is very different from that on our planet. All thanks to a runaway greenhouse effect that has been going on for a long, long time. The surface of Venus can get even hotter than the surface of Mercury 864 degrees F. And the surface pressure feels as if you're more than half a mile underwater. The thick atmosphere presents its own challenges. Its clouds consist of sulfuric acid, which is used in lead-acid batteries, as well as industrial cleaners. And if you decided to land on the planet, you'd have to survive atmospheric entry, with friction heating you up to 20,000 degrees F. Still, people have always wanted to explore this inhospitable world. And we can't but talk about the Venera program. During the 1970s and 1980s, several spacecraft studied Venus from orbit and from its hostile surface for an hour or so at a time. The 10 successful Venera landers provided us with most of the data we have today about the surface of this mysterious planet, including surface composition, direct measurements of atmospheric conditions, and sets of unique images. At the same time, astronomers got their hands on these treasures, only after a series of annoying failures. They started with Venera 1, launched in February 1961, each consequent spacecraft was somehow improved and upgraded. But it still wasn't until the fifth group of Venus-bound space probes launched in 1967 that one of them, Venera 4, reached its target and sent data from Venus. Before that, Venera 2 and 3, launched in November 1965, were supposed to land on Venus, but both of them failed in transit. 11-foot-tall Venera 4 was a hefty thing. Its bottom lander was a bunch of instruments and a battery wrapped up in a pressure shell equipped with a parachute. This probe reached Venus in October 1967 and successfully launched the lander. The mother spaceship sent the probe flying over the planet and it entered Venus's atmosphere. Temperatures were reaching 20,000 degrees F and the entry force was as great as 450 G. It didn't prevent the onboard instruments from analyzing the atmosphere and sending back data. The first recorded temperature was 102 degrees F, and atmospheric pressure was similar to that on Earth. But the deeper the probe went, the higher the numbers became. 10 atmospheres, 20. They kept going up much higher than engineers had anticipated. 93 minutes into the mission, when the probe was still more than 16 miles above the surface of the planet, Venera 4 cracked open near its top and crashed. At the crash point, the measurements showed 22 atmospheres and 530 degrees F. Scientists realized that they needed a bigger spaceship. After some intense engineering, Venera 5 and Venera 6 saw the light of the day. Engineers did everything they could to make the landing probe stronger, but they were pressed for time. 
That's why Venera 5 and 6 were not fully prepared when they went on a mission. That's why Venera 5 transmitted data for a mere 53 minutes before succumbing to temperatures of 600 degrees F and pressures of 27 atmospheres. And Venera 6 lasted for 51 minutes. In any case now, the leaders of the project knew what it would take. 840 degrees F, 100 atmospheres, corrosive acids. They seemed to be prepared. They found new materials to build the probe. They got a hotter and stronger test chamber for the trials. They modified the parachute to make the lander fall faster so that the probe could spend as much time on the surface as possible. The lander was also designed in the shape of an egg and made of titanium, so its surface was smooth and had just a few ports, welds, and substructures. The insides were lined with a shock absorber and insulation layer. The chamber was also to pre-chill to freezing temperatures before entry. And Venera 7 was finally a success. It reached the planet in December 1970, separated from the mothership, and went down into the atmosphere. The probe transmitted data for 35 minutes, and things seemed smooth. But then, its chute melted, and the probe dropped like a rock, hitting the ground at 35 miles per hour and bouncing. Then, a second after the landing, the signal was abruptly cut. It looked like the probe crashed to bits. Shockingly, a few months later, while looking through all the data they managed to get, engineers rediscovered the signal. It was super weak and lost amidst the noise. Apparently, when Venera 7 bounced, it misaligned the antenna. The probe rested on its side which weakened the signal to 1 or 3% of its initial strength. The probe kept transmitting data for 23 minutes. After that, the temperatures got too high and melted its shell. Venera 8, launched in 1972, had a similar design and experienced a similar fate. Venera 9 and 10 were a new generation of probes. They could send back black and white photos. It was actually the probe's main goal to send the first ever photographic panorama from another planet. Venera 9 and 10 were five times heavier than their predecessors and weighed five tons at launch. The lander was six and a half feet tall. It was basically a hermetically sealed titanium sphere that was supposed to hold the instruments. It was bolted with gold wire seals. Inside, there were shelves of beryllium and electric fans whose main goal was to disperse heat to prevent instrument failure. On the bottom of the lander, there was a shock absorbing ring. And at the top, there was a titanium ring that looked like a hat. It served as an aero brake. The parachute was supposed to detach at 30 miles above the surface, and the aero brake had to do the rest. In October 1975, Venera 9 and 10 arrived at Venus and landed as planned. Venera 9 was the first to land. It touched down on a slight slope, a volcanic crater or a hill, and kicked quite a bit of dust while landing. One of its two cameras succeeded in photographing and transmitting data, and soon scientists saw the first ever pictures of the surface of Venus. It was mostly sharp rocks, soil, and a distant horizon. The sun was slightly obscured by clouds that day. A gentle breeze was blowing. Overall, it was a pleasant morning. If you didn't pay attention to crushing pressure, almost completely waterless atmosphere, insanely high temperatures, and corrosive acids. Venera 10 landed in the same way a few days later, but the terrain it landed on was much more boring. Just a rolling plain with hardened pieces of magma. Both probes transmitted for 40 to 60 minutes until their orbiters went out of range. When it happened, the temperatures inside the probes were reaching 140 degrees F. The orbiters later burned up in the atmosphere after completing their mission. Venera 11 and 12 could have been a success, but a mysterious electric anomaly messed up with their cameras, so their trip was quickly forgotten. And Venera 13 and 14 entered the picture. They had improved scientific instruments and cameras that could take color images, and new heat-resistant technologies were used during the creation of these probes. Venera 13 arrived first and landed as planned. It took two photos, one black and white and the other in color. In the photos, one could see a surface of pebbled, 
loose soil, and outcroppings of bedrock. It all looked pretty similar to the surface of the ocean. In the distance, there were rolling plateaus and an orange sky. The images taken later by Venera 14 showed a more weathered plain with less loose soil and fine-grained rocks. The two probes also sent back what they heard. It mostly sounded like a gently blowing wind with hints of distant rumbling. Could be Venus quakes. Venera, 13 and 14 were the last landers to touch the surface of the planet. Venera, 15 and 16 just flew around Venus, mapping its topography from orbit. The two Voyager spacecraft have had a great track record. They took photos of such planets as Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, and then just kept going, beyond the outer edge of the solar system. At the moment, Voyager 1 is more than 15 billion miles away from our planet and is still transmitting. Surprisingly, it takes only 22 hours for the signal to travel from the spacecraft to Earth but how is it even possible to send signals for such unimaginable distances, considering that the satellite's processor is weaker than the processor from car keys? Both Voyager spacecraft use 23-watt radios. This is higher than the 3 watts a regular phone uses, but it's still considered to be a low-power transmitter. Interestingly, because of the ginormous distance, the phone's 3-watt signal, traveling around 100 miles on Earth, is billions of billions times more powerful than a 23-watt signal coming from Voyager. By the way, large radio stations on Earth transmit at tens of thousands of watts. This puzzle is easy to solve. The key to receiving the signal is not the power of the radio, but a combination of three other things. First, there must be very large antennas. Second, there must be directional antennas pointing at each other. And third, we need radio frequencies without tons of human-made interference. The antennas the Voyager space probes use are indeed very big. Have you ever seen satellite dish antennas some people have in their yards? They're typically 6 to 10 feet in diameter. Well, the Voyager spacecraft has an antenna which is 12 feet in diameter. And it transmits to large antennas on our planet. Earth antennas and the Voyager antenna are pointed right at each other. The centers for receiving signals from voyagers located on our planet are positioned at an angle of 120 degrees to each other. This allows them to provide Voyager 1 coverage at any time of the day, no matter what Earth's position is in relation to the spacecraft. These receiving stations are situated in Australia, Deep Space Network Station in Canberra, the USA, and Spain. Let's try to figure out how communication works on Voyager 1. To do so, we need to discuss the design features of the space probe's radio reception equipment and the computer system serving it. We'll start with AASC, which stands for the Articulation and Control Relationship System. Its main purpose is to send data about Voyager's position in space and its route back to Earth. High gain AASC antenna is always directed toward Earth to help amplify the weak signal. By the way, once it broke down, but specialists repaired it by updating the program. Voyager's signal strength keeps decreasing, causing the data rate from the spacecraft to Earth to decrease too. In 2017, for example, the probe's signal strength was many, many times weaker than the signal of a conventional FM receiver. Luckily, modern technology has seriously improved the sensitivity of the receiving antenna network. The increase in signal gain is achieved by capturing the signal from Voyager by a station on Earth to provide stable communication between the probe and Earth. The wave frequency should equal 2114 MHZ. As for reverse communication from our planet to Voyager, it occurs when the space probe receivers are synchronized with the frequency of the uplink carrier by phase. 
The probe converts it into a two-way downlink carrier signal and sends it back to Earth. Not so long ago, NASA announced that Voyager 1 had started experiencing problems with determining its position in space. The data the spacecraft was sending to Earth had nothing to do with its estimated trajectory and flight speed, but specialists at NASA managed to figure out where the failure was. The AASC had started sending data through an onboard computer that had stopped working years before. It was this computer that had been corrupting the information. Once experts realized what the issue was, they commanded the AACS to resume sending data to the right computer. At the moment, Voyager 1 seems to be still traveling along its initial path, which is indirectly indicated by the stability of the radio signal emitted by the probe. Speaking of Voyager's journey, gravity assists their maneuvers. When they were launched, all the giant planets were conveniently located in a relatively narrow region of the solar system, and the spacecraft managed to visit all of them at once. Both Voyagers are carrying time capsules intended for any intelligent extraterrestrial civilization. These capsules include greetings in 55 languages, as well as different sounds and images. By the way, Voyager 2 is now over 40 years old and is the most distant human-made object. And shockingly, scientists are still fixing its software issues.